Hello and welcome to a brand new Bible study. I hope that you've had a great week, that maybe you've studied some of the other ones along with me, and we're going to get right into it today. It's called Under Pressure. So this is one that I thought, oh, I don't want to do another study. We're hearing it all around. We're seeing it all around. And I, you know, talked with the Lord and I thought, Lord, we hear about COVID all year round and it's still going on. I don't want to mention it again. But, you know, because of the longevity and the situation that we all find ourselves in globally right now, it's not something we should sweep under the cover as well, under the cover. And so it's something that I think it will really help you maybe have some practical tips of how to handle stress right now that is in your life and mine. First, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Now, it's something that probably all of us could attest. I have been there more than one time where I despaired of how to even keep going on. And maybe it doesn't have to do with the pandemic. Maybe it's a totally different pressure in your life or something you've been through or something yet ahead. But we need to know how to handle pressure and stress, ladies, by the word of God. Um, stress, a definition is it's a pressure which stems from being made of our own physical, emotional, or spiritual strength. Uh, also, pressure is stress. They go hand in hand and they are each other. <clears throat> but stress isn't necessarily always a bad thing. A good friend of mine, uh, Miss Debbie Pride, has helped me with this and shared me some different um, some thoughts on this. And I've coupled it with a few other things that I've looked into in the Word of God. But such a help to have a godly friend that will not only say, oh, I've got an answer for you or, oh, we can get through this. But it is priceless to have a godly friend that says, you know, the answer is in the word of God. And I really appreciate that about Mrs. Pride. She has helped me so many times over the years. And there's never been a time that she didn't help me that she didn't open the word of God. Um, a friend that knows the word of God, searches it, um, is such a blessing. Thank the Lord for that. And if you don't have it in your life, ask God for that. But, um, you know, stress, it can force us to rely on God in prayer. That's why it's not bad. It causes me to go to my knees. It causes me to realize, Angie, you're not in control. You don't know the timeline here. And you don't know how strong that pressure is going to be. But you know the God of all gods that does know those answers and can help you. It also can cause me to reach higher goals. You know, this last year, I've set some goals that I never would have thought even possible or even on my list if it weren't for lockdowns and mandates. I've done some things that, wow, it really was a blessing that that got done. And there were other things that because of pressure and stress this last year, I let slip. I didn't do the best. And those were the times where I wasn't walking with the Lord as I should. Stress also helps us to solve problems. It helps us to prioritize what is important in life. It helps us to change direction. God can get a hold of us and say, you're not on the wrong path. Here's a little bit of stress to see what kind of right choices you make. Uh, when pressure strains or disrupts our plans, it often, re, um, it actually is more, it becomes another level, if you will. It turns into distress. Um, it's referred to as a stress, but then even my own actions can make that pressure even tighter, even worse than what it was. I saw and found something very interesting that I'd never heard of on this topic of stress, and it's called the Stockholm Syndrome. Maybe you've heard of this or some of this story, uh, but I'm about to share. But it was very interesting, and when I just was reading it, it shocked me. But then as it was explained further, um, it made me understand a little bit, but it also warned me of the dangers of stress, how if I don't go to the Lord 
stress and those pressures can cause me to change my belief system and really become anti-God, become to where I don't go to him for the things that I ought to go to. So the term Stockholm Syndrome first occurred in 1973 at an attempted bank robbery in Stockholm, Sweden. A man tried to raid rob a bank and the police caught him inside. He took three female hostages and one male hostage, hostage, held them for 131 hours, during which time he terrorized them. He fired his Russian automatic assault weapon at them. He threatened to kill them on numerous occasions. He put nooses around their necks and threatened to hang them, but he didn't actually harm any of them. When he finally surrendered, something very unusual happened. They expected the hostages to become antagonistic toward him, um, to hate him, to want to seek vengeance. But instead, the hostages said that they actually feared the police more than they did the hostage taker. They also said that they didn't hate him and they actually refused to testify against the hostage taker. One of the ladies actually became engaged to the hostage taker. So when I stopped there in the store, I thought that is just ludicrous that something like that would happen. Well, the FBI analyzed uh, a thousand different hostage situations since that time. Over and over, they've tried to analyze it, compare it, see how is this possible and why did this happen? They found that it actually happens quite frequently. Psychologists have been asked, what happened? What causes this? They said that in hostage situations with a high level of life-threatening stress and positive human interaction, the people's ego system, they come into play. There's a denial of what is happening and a regression to a different emotional state. The hostage will eventually begin to transfer his hatred this guy doesn't really want to hate us. And they begin to hate the policeman instead. And something else very important happens. A love relationship takes place. And this love relationship is what happens between a young child and a mother. The mother is protecting the child from the terrifying world and providing all of its needs. This relationship occurs both ways. And I'll pause right there in the story because it does go on further. Ladies, when we take stress and allow it to change my walk with the Lord and I become fearful and I doubt and I worry, I turn into this situation. I become the Stockholm Syndrome. Here, the very one who created me, who loves me, that has all the answers and all the comfort, I turn away from but I embrace the worry and the hatred and the fear. Uh, and I become anxiety ridden, riddled, if you will. And God says, there's another way to handle stress than this. So the rest of it goes on to say, one of the most un outstanding examples of this syndrome occurred in Holland in the 1970s. A group of terrorists captured a whole train load of people. They made demands on the Dutch government. The Dutch government did not come through. So they began to murder people. They murdered two on the first day. And on the second day, they selected a man by the name of Ger Ger Gerard Vaters. They brought him out and said, say all of your prayers, you're going to die. He said, okay, but before I die, there's a man that knows my family that's here. I'd like to give him a message. Of course, the South Malukans wanted to listen in. He said, I feel my, the man who was about to be murdered said, I feel my life has been a failure. He wanted to tell his wife that he was sorry. He went on and on and on about his problems. He became a real human being to those hostage takers instead of just a symbol to be executed. In the end, those terrorists were unable to execute him because of all that he said. And this has happened many times in hostage situations. Ladies, Satan holds you and I and others in bondage to their sin 
as long as we fear and as long as we hate anyone who's trying to help us, we need to reach out to the Lord Jesus Christ who's offering that hand of help like a policeman in a hostage situation and realize and ask God, Lord, help me to see clearly. There are a lot of pressures. There are a lot of stresses. But would you give me clarity? Would you give me uh, discernment in this situation to see your love and not embrace the world? I found a poem and it says, A careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate instill. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. Ladies, what have your words done in the last seven days? Is it the first half of that poem where there's strife and hate and smite and kill and wreck? Or even if it's just one person, have your words smoothed the way, shown Jesus Christ the light of day? Have you helped lessen stress? Have you helped to heal and bless? I encourage you to ask God to help you in this, in this um, area of our words. Because how I'm taking in the stress of life is going to come out of my mouth and out of my words. But with God's help, I can help stress it, excuse me, lessen and lighten the day and the way for someone else and point them to Jesus Christ. Now, stay tuned for part two, because I've got a lot of scriptures in part two next week um, and some practical tips to remember how to handle when you are under pressure. Thank you for listening and watching, ladies. We'll see you next time.